A story. If you can call it a story, there's no real beginning or end, and there's very little in the middle. It's all about a day's outing by Sharabang to Porth Call, which, of course, the Sharabang never reached, and it happened when I was so high and much nicer. I was staying at the time with my uncle and his wife. Although she was my aunt, I never thought of her as anything but the wife of my uncle, partly because he was so big and trumpeting and red hairy and used to fill every inch of the hot little house like an old buffalo squeezed into an airing cupboard, and partly because she was so small and silk and quick and made no noise at all as she whisked about on padded paws, dusting the china dogs, feeding the buffalo, setting the mouse traps that never caught her. And once she sneaked out of the room to squeak in a nook or nibble in the hayloft, you forgot she had ever been there. But there he was always, a steaming hulk of an uncle, his braces straining like hawsers, crammed behind the counter of the tiny shop at the front of the house, and breathing like a brass band, or guzzling and blustery in the kitchen over his gutsy supper, too big for everything except the great black boats of his boots. As he ate, the house grew smaller. He billowed out over the furniture, the loud check meadow of his waistcoat littered as though after a picnic with cigarette ends, peelings, cabbage stalks, birds' bones, gravy, and the forest fire of his hair crackled among the hooked hams from the ceiling. She was so small she could hit him only if she stood on a chair, and every Saturday night at half-past ten he would lift her up under his arm onto a chair in the kitchen so that she could hit him on the head with whatever was handy, which was always a china dog. On Sundays and when pickled, he sang high tenor and had won many cups. The first I heard of the annual outing was when I was sitting one evening on a bag of rice behind the counter under one of my uncle's stomachs, reading an advertisement for sheep dip, which was all there was to read. The shop was full of my uncle, and when Mr. Benjamin Franklin, Mr. Weasley, Noah Bowen, and Will Sentry came in, I thought it would burst. It was like all being together in a drawer that smelt of cheese and terps and twist tobacco and sweet biscuits and snuff and waistcoat. Mr. Benjamin Franklin said that he had collected enough money for the Sharabang and twenty cases of pale ale and a pound apiece over that he would distribute among the members of the outing when they first stopped for refreshment, and he was about sick and tired, he said, of being followed by Will Sentry. All day long, wherever I go, he said, he's after me like a collie with one eye. I got a shadow of my own and a dog. I don't need no Tom, Dick or Harry pursuing me with his dirty muffler on. Will Sentry blushed and said, it's only oily. I got a bicycle. A man has no privacy at all, Mr. Franklin went on. I tell you, we stick so close, I'm afraid to go out the back in case I sit in his lap. It's a wonder to me, he said. He don't follow me into bed at night. Wife won't let, Will Sentry said. And that started Mr. Franklin off again, and they tried to soothe him down by saying, Don't you mind, Will Sentry? There's no harm in old Will. He's only keeping an eye on the money, Benji. "'Aren't I honest?' asked Mr. Franklin in surprise. There was no answer for some time. Then Noah Bowen said, "'Oh, you know what the committee is. Ever since Bob the Fiddle, they don't feel safe with a new treasurer. "'Well, do you think I'm going to drink the outing funds like Bob the Fiddle did?' said Mr. Franklin. "'You might,' said my uncle slowly. "'I resign,' said Mr. Franklin. "'Not with our money, you won't,' Will Sentry said." After a time, they all began to play cards in the thickening dusk of the hot, cheesy shop, and my uncle blew and bugled whenever he won, and Mr. Weasley grumbled like a dredger. And I fell to sleep on the gravy-scented mountain meadow of Uncle's waistcoat. On Sunday evening, after Bethesda, Mr. Franklin walked into the kitchen where my uncle and I were eating sardines with spoons from the tin, because it was Sunday and his wife would not let us play draughts. She was somewhere in the kitchen, too. Perhaps she was inside the grandmother clock, hanging from the weights and breathing. Then, a second later, the door opened again and Will Sentry edged into the room, twiddling his hard, round hat. He and Mr. Franklin sat down in the settee, stiff and mothballed and black in their chapel and funeral suits. "'I brought the list,' said Mr. Franklin. "'Every member fully paid.' 
You ask Will Sentry. My uncle put on his spectacles, wiped his whiskery mouth with a handkerchief big as a Union Jack, laid down his spoon of sardines, took Mr. Franklin's list of names, removed the spectacles so that he could read, and then ticked the names off one by one. Enoch Davis, aye. He's good with his fists. You never know. Little Gerwine, very melodious bass. Mr. Cadwallader, that's right, he can tell opening time better than my watch. Mr. Weasley, of course, he's been to Paris. Pity he suffers so much in the Charabang. Stopped us nine times last year between the Beehive and the Red Dragon. Noah Bowen, ah, very peaceable. He's got a tongue like a turtle dove. Never an argument with Noah Bowen. Jenkins Lucher, hmm. Keep him off economics. It cost us a plate glass window and ten pints for the sergeant. Mr. Jervis, very tidy. He tried to put a pig in a shara, Will Sentry said. Live and let live, said my uncle. Will Sentry blushed. Sinbad the sailor's arms, got to keep in with him. Old O. Jones. Why old O. Jones, said Will Sentry. Old O. Jones always goes, said my uncle. I looked down at the kitchen table. The tin of sardines was gone. By gee, I said to myself, Uncle's wife is quick as a flash. Cuthbert Johnny Fortnight. No, there's a card, said my uncle. He whistles after women, Will Sentry said. So do you, said Mr. Benjamin Franklin. In your mind. My uncle at last approved the whole list, pausing only to say when he came across one name. <gasps> If we weren't a Christian community, we'd chuck that Bob the Fiddle in the sea. Oh, we can do that in Porth Call, said Mr. Franklin. And soon after that he went, Will Sentry no more than an inch behind him, their Sunday bright boots squeaking on the kitchen cobbles. And then suddenly there was my uncle's wife standing in front of the dresser with a china dog in one hand. If you go on that outing on Saturday, Mr. Thomas... She said to my uncle in her small, silk voice, I'm going home to my mother's. Holy mo, I thought. She's got a mother. It's me or the outing, Mr. Thomas. I would have made my choice at once, but it was almost half a minute before my uncle said, Well then, Sarah, it's the outing, my love. He lifted her up under his arm onto a chair in the kitchen, and she hit him on the head with the china dog. Then he lifted it down again, and then I said, Good night. At breakfast time on Saturday morning, the morning of the outing, I found a note on the kitchen table. It said, There's some eggs in the pantry. Take your boots off before you go to bed. My uncle's wife had gone as quick as a flash. When my uncle saw the note, he tugged out the flag of his handkerchief and blew such a hubbub of trumpets that the plates in the dresser shook. It's the same every year, he said. And then he looked at me. But this year it's different. You'll have to come on the outing too. And what the members will say, I dare not think. The charabang drew up outside, and when the members of the outing saw my uncle and me squeeze out of the shop together, both of us catlicked and brushed in our Sunday best, they snarled like a zoo. Are you bringing a boy? asked Mr. Benjamin Franklin as we climbed into the charabang. He looked at me with horror. Boys is nasty, said Mr. Weasley. He hasn't paid his contributions, Will Sentry said. No room for boys. Boys get sick in charabangs. So do you, Enoch Davis, said my uncle. Might as well bring women. The way they said it, women were worse than boys. Better than bringing grandfathers. Grandfathers is nasty too, said Mr. Weasley. What can we do with him when we stop for refreshments? I'm a grandfather, said Mr. Weasley. Twenty-six minutes to opening time, shouted an old man in a Panama hat, not looking at a watch. They forgot me at once. Good old Mr. Cadwallader, they cried, and the charabang started off down the village street. A few cold women stood at their doorways, grimly watching us go. A very small boy waved goodbye, and his mother boxed his ears. It was a beautiful August morning. We were out of the village and over the bridge and up the hill towards Steeple Hatwood when Mr. Franklin, with his list of names in his hand, called out loud, Where's old O'Jones? 
Oh, where's Old Orr? We've left Old Orr behind. Can't go without Old Orr. And though Mr. Weasley hissed all the way, we turned and drove back to the village where, outside the Prince of Wales, Old O. Jones was waiting patiently and alone with a canvas bag. Oh, I didn't want to come at all, Old O. Jones said as they hoisted him into the sharabang and clapped him on the back and pushed him on a seat and stuck a bottle in his hand. But I always go... And over the bridge and up the hill, and under the deep green wood, and along the dusty road we wove, slow cows and ducks flying by, until... Stop the bus! Mr. Weasley cried. I left my teeth on the mantelpiece. Never you mind, they said. You're not going to bite nobody. And they gave him a bottle with a straw. I might want to smile, he said. Not you, they said. What's the time, Mr. Cadwallader? Twelve minutes to go, shouted back the old man in the Panama. And they all began to curse him.